Welcome to the Food Startups Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the Food Startups Podcast. I am here today with Danny, and we have a special guest that we're going to introduce in a little bit, and we're going to be broadcasting today from three countries. I'm here in Bogota. Three countries and three continents, actually. I'm, uh, I'm up here in snowy, snowy, snowy New York City. Great, great. And in a little bit, we're going to introduce our, our guest, uh, Gaurav Gupta. But first, we wanted to go over a couple of things with the show. Um, we are now available in Stitcher, if you guys use that app, not just iTunes and Libsyn and a couple other feeds. And we also wanted to give a shout out to the first two customer reviews for our podcast. Um, the first one is by SNG Lib. He says, the Food Starters podcast is a great resource. I'm going to paraphrase here. Two Americans covering out niches in Latin America. Very informative. If you're looking to get started in the food industry, particularly in South America as an exporter, great resource. Danny and Matt will point you in the right direction. Thanks so much. That sounds great, man. That's right on point. That's uh, that's what we like to hear. Yeah, yeah. And then we got another five star from Packet two three eight six, and he leaves his name as Eric Packet, and he says, "Brilliant dudes with great knowledge on the food industry. Danny and Matt are extremely sharp and clearly know what they are talking about. This podcast is entertaining and informant. A must listen." In all caps, if you are in the industry. Well, thanks so much, Eric, for the review. And moving into the show today, you know, we're going to get more guests this year in 2014, and we have a really, really seasoned industry veteran in food, you know, import and export all over the world. We're going to post his full bio on on foodstarspodcast.com. Without further ado, we'd like to introduce Gaurav Gupta. Gaurav, how you doing? Very well, man. How are you? Doing very good. Gaurav, um, just to give our listeners a little bit of an idea of your career, can you give us a quick background? Okay. So uh, basically, we as a company, G-Square, started doing food products into South Africa. And uh, from there, we, we expanded into Latin America. And now we are doing trading both ways. We're exporting products from Asia into South America and from South America into Asia. We uh, produce, buy a lot of uh, Peruvian uh, products like quinoa and lentils, some seafood from Chile. And we're trying to get also into the coffee business from Colombia for the Asian market. From this side, we are moving rice, lentils, and spices. And these spices should be on the Colombian shelves in in less than a month. That's fantastic. Fantastic. First of all, congrats, because I know last time that we spoke, uh, that was still a process. And uh, uh, I know things work slowly. Yes. In Colombia, so uh, you've made some great progress on that, seems like. Yeah, thanks. It got, we got lucky, because even though this is a time for siesta and fiesta in Colombia, I think we just got lucky and got us products pushed through. Definitely. Well, it's, it says something about your quality that if they're really, uh, they, they know they need to stock uh, stock their shelves. Actually, maybe for their minchiladas, they need some of their, uh, they need some salt and peppers and different spices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's impressive though, how, how fast you moved uh, through that and, and, and got the, the, you know, got the spices ready and, and got into stores, you know, because, yeah. you know, I don't know, I'm speaking for myself. That I don't think I'm capable at this point of, of moving things that quickly from another country into Colombia. So that's really impressive. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It's been a process, though. It's taken us almost a year to do it. So luckily, I think now it's the end phase where we're going to be there. Excellent. Gwara, I, I want to ask you and backtrack just a second. So, you sure. know, uh, we, we mentioned we're doing uh, we're, we're we're on the air from three different <laughs> continents, but your your okay. businesses do businesses in Africa and South America and Asia. And man, that's uh, I mean, that's really impressive. Uh, but uh, bring us back right. to the start. How and why did you get started uh, in the food business and import and exportation? Uh, good question. I started, actually, I had gone to South Africa and, uh, you know, in Johannesburg and Cape Town, and I saw <clears throat> that they, the food that they had was not of very high quality. It was the whole food operations was run by fly-by-night operators, you know, who were just coming in, unloading uh, bad material or maybe some material they picked up at discount, and this is your basic foods. And uh, I realized there was a big gap in the market, and I could fill that gap at a price which was just 
just a little bit higher. And once people in South Africa started realizing they were getting quality product from us, they accepted the product really quickly and they would ask for it by name, even though we were slightly more expensive. And, you know, that's when I realized that if I can give uh, a quality product and quality food to somebody, that is something that uh, I should definitely stay in this business. So that's how initially I got started. Mm. Very interesting. So in a way, you kind of uh, carved out a reputation or a brand for your company um, because it's really hard to do that otherwise. Uh, you know, I, I think it's really hard to separate yourself, especially, uh, you know, coming in from a, not having a background or not having a previous brand to piggyback off from. Exactly. Yeah. It was tough in the beginning. You know, getting the initial orders was is always tough as in any business. But uh, you know, I think it was just it was just a matter of reliability that people saw that even after we sent in a few shipments, we were still there. You know, standing back and saying yes, this is our product. And if you have a problem with the product, we're standing right here. So that reliability is what kind of built a name. Exactly, man. That's awesome. That's a great story. And that, I, I, I see that happening increasingly in the USA as far as the market uh, uh, really being backed up. Uh, p- people see a company and they want to see the face behind it. And same thing goes in Europe now. Uh, they see a company and the products, they want to see the face behind it and they want to see reliability. And so do the, you know, on a business to business level that applies as well. Absolutely. You know, the world is becoming small. In the beginning, there were these huge corporations, which uh, which doesn't work anymore because you need to know who's giving you your product or your service. And you have to know that they're going to be there when things uh, go sour as well. Right, right. Great. Now, now, Gaurav, a question for you. You know, can you just give us a compare in contrast between you know middle east china southeast asia africa south america any differences or or similarities you see between these these continents and countries sure it's a it's a very broad topic uh, but to pick off a few i would say the the beginning i would say is decision making and trust it's easy and faster in certain markets like uh, you know africa or the middle east it's people will give you an order faster the decision making process is not so layered but if you go to south america for example you know things take a lot of time people move at a very slow pace if you go to southeast asia there's just a lot of layers from where you start to where you finish. So, uh, you know, timing, decision-making and timing is, I think, a very big uh, difference between any country that you work in, um, any continent that you work in, sorry. Another is also the appetite for risk. Uh, Southeast Asia and South America are not very... um, not very, not very adventurous or risk takers in that process, but if you go to the Middle East or even China, sometimes they would, uh, you know, they would they would get into something new if they thought the product had uh, had potential. Whereas you need to prove that potential in, let's say, South America or Southeast Asia. Um, in uh, similarities, I would say that basic similarity is that everybody wants a company that you know they can rely on and also somebody who's going to back them when sometimes <clears throat> things are going bad from their side and trust of course is something which everybody wants mm-hmm. so um, sure yeah yeah uh, sorry a uh, quick follow-up i was just thinking um so uh, with that in mind uh, you think you can just lead me through really quick like you know how did you get how did you really uh how did you kind of go all in when you were when uh, starting from South Africa and then uh, just moving on to various geographies where your uh, where your companies um, uh, play in right now? How did you kind of decide, like, you know, uh, listen, we're really on to something. We're really on to something because it's really hard to do business across these different continents and different cultures that you don't know. I mean, I, I can't. Uh, I, uh, it's hard for me to imagine doing business in Argentina or Brazil and they're on the same continent as Colombia. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can get that. Absolutely. In fact, you know, sometimes even the, even the more closer the uh, countries are, they're actually more different in uh, doing business. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, you know, what we actually do is when we go into a market, we try and see in different parts of the world where there's a gap and where we've been filling that gap. Now, the thing with food and the products that we do is there's certain markets which <clears throat> we know we can offer better quality or a better price. Or there is certain markets where we know that our product does not exist in this market or there's no competing product. So we need to introduce that product into the market. So that's what we look for, you know, and once we have that market, then we get in. Of course, the cultural, um, you know, the cultural barriers is there for any export business. It can be within the same country. You look at Colombia itself and there's a lot of difference in doing business between Bogota, Cali and Medellin. Mm -hmm. So every, I mean, like you rightly said, countries in the same continent are different. I would say even cities are different. It's just a matter of, you know, understanding it. And sometimes you need to push and sometimes you need to know when to step back and just understand what is going on over there. And uh, I think we've, you know, we've, we've spent some money, we've understood the market, we've tried to get some local players or local partners on the ground, you know, who will kind of guide us through the final steps in certain markets. So it's uh, it's it's really hard to say that each place is uh, you know you can whatever works for one country or one city will work for a different one. Gotcha. Yeah. Make, uh, no. Great response. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, this information yeah. is great, and I think our listeners are going to be really thrilled <laughs> to have it, um, especially because mm-hmm. you've covered you know almost the whole world in in your your business venture so that's really cool um moving on we wanted to talk about this and and gaurav i know you'd agree with us in this sense that you know our listeners are usually in the beginning phase right it's for startups right and it's also you know the the quotes where it's like when you really need help you can't get it and then when everyone's offering their hand to you you have already kind of succeeded and the idea that you know like when you're starting out that's it's Exactly. Very, very That's difficult, true. right? And Correct, yeah. and we wanted to know, like, what were your your biggest challenges in the first few years of launching your business? Yeah, it's a good question. And like you rightly said, you know, in the beginning, it's really difficult because, uh, you know, nobody knows you. So the whole question is, how do you gain orders or how do you gain trust? Today, if I have to place an order on you, you know, how do I know you're not going to run away with the money or, uh, you know, so so I think the biggest challenge for any entrepreneur is initially is just to break into the market. And for that, I would I would say that whatever advice I would give is to do your homework and do your background check and see the product or the service that you're offering and see that why, you know, is there a niche product? Is there a price competitiveness which you can offer? There has to be some USP to you doing that business as well because no matter what you get into today, the world is very competitive. And as an entrepreneur, as the biggest, even for me, the biggest challenge was just getting, initially was just getting all is getting people to trust me and when I started in 2003 the world wasn't as connected so it would take a long time for people to you know understand that yes you're here so initially it's getting orders the other thing is also raising finance Mm -hmm. I think capital is is another big problem because you know what all what terms of financing do you have and uh, this is a very funny thing but even now like you know that we've been established and working if we talk to like let's say banks or any finance companies to finance let's say an order or a letter of credit from south america or africa the rates we get are much higher versus let's say a letter of credit or a loan from the middle east so Mm -hmm. You know, again, the market that you're working in also depends on the kind of uh, pricing that you get. Yeah, very interesting. You know, wh- one thing that I was thinking about when you're talking about how the the world is shrinking and flattening is just that uh, on my end in Colombia, I found that I almost uh, want to be in a, in a geography where it's difficult to do business simply because if I work hard, I'm able to have a competitive advantage in True. that area once I have some experience. And so, you know, like you said, because things are things have changed so quickly in the past few years. Um, so what are you uh, just uh, going from that? What's kind of your what's your growth strategy in like the next uh, three to five years? Now that you've had some success, you understand how to overcome challenges and uh, you have a great offering. 
Yeah, good question. For us, uh, right now, the, uh, we're going to be focusing in Latin America in a bigger way. I want to set up uh, more. Right now, we're exporting from India and some products from Asia. But uh, what, I, what I'm setting up now is a packaging unit in Colombia itself, which can focus on the entire Andean region and, and also expand into Central America. So that is where I'm looking at. You know, it took us a year to break into the market, but I feel the work is now going to start for us. Now is where the actual work comes in. So the idea is that once we have a little bit of a foothold or a foot through the door, the idea is to get in completely. So uh, basically, we're going to be focusing in Latin America for a while now because like, there's a lot of potential. And like you rightly said, right now, there is there's not that many people in the market. You know, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very basic. So if you get in now, it's a good time. And did you say, Gaurav, you said you're going to work on packaging? Packaging. Yes, we're going to set up a packaging unit that we can bring our products in in bulk and package it there so we can take advantage of a few tax breaks as well. Oh, wow. Well, um, at least for Danny and I, the packaging is like the the biggest struggle, one of the biggest struggles that we encounter. So that's cool to hear that you're you're going to be offering packaging services. The The quality here, there's plenty to, there's plenty of improvement and plenty of space here. So that sounds like a really uh, promising Venture. Absolutely, I, you know, I've been through the same thing over there. It's it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's 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 cheaper actually for us to package it here and send it than get product there. That sounds about right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's that's great though. It's cool, and you know, um, I think uh, you th- there are different ways to do it in in each industry. So it's it's great, like you said, to do your homework and take your time and figure it out, figure out what's best for you and your company and how and what your setup is. You know, I mean. Because you need to be crystal clear on that at some point. You need to make your decision. Are you going to do the packaging, yeah. uh, you know, in South Asia uh, or are you going to do it, uh, you know, in South America? Exactly. Yeah. You know, you have to look at everything. I mean, what comes in at that point is then you're looking at timelines. You're looking at how can your suppliers supply you on time? Can they finish the packaging on time? And I'm sure, like, you know, in Colombia, everything, the way it works, you know, anything, any timing is not really adhered to as well. So it's better, you know, when you have fixed contracts with suppliers that you make sure that your product is, uh, you know, your back end supply is very strong. Yep. Good to hear. And, and Gaurav, a yeah. question for you. Um, how Have you ever had to enforce contracts for like a breach of contract? Because, you know, it's like one thing to, to sign a contract with someone, but and then if someone yeah. breaks it, to actually legally take action against them or resolve it. Have you gone through any of those processes? Uh, we have, but not with a lot of success. What usually happens is that, you know, you sign the contract and uh, uh, especially being a foreign company, it, it takes, you know, it, uh, it takes a longer time for you to get any kind of compensation. So what happens is you put in the you put in the case, and you kind of then come to a settlement in the beginning. Like we've put in a couple of cases, but they've never totally gone through because we've always come to some kind of settlement. Um, so that is the part of enforcing contracts. It's it's tough, you know, especially as a foreigner, it's very tough. But the idea is that, you, you know, once you do put a little bit of pressure, you find different ways of, of getting at least uh, getting some compensation or getting some deal out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gaurav, and, uh, let me ask, I, I want to ask you a question that uh, we kind of, uh, Matt and I have talked about this a lot. Um, uh, we talk, uh, this is a question more about startups and the startup phase earlier on in your business. You know, uh, uh, being an entrepreneur is really tough, and uh, being a food entrepreneur is tougher uh, than than being a regular entrepreneur in this day and age, um, sure. uh, because there's so many challenges. Uh, exactly. Was there ever was was there ever a time where uh, things weren't working out because of bad breaks, because of just uh, I mean uh, lack lack of uh, partners, lack of capital? W- was there a time where you thought about giving up, and how did you respond? Yeah, good question. There was uh, right in the beginning, actually, our first shipment, which we sent into South Africa at the port, it was infected by termites and it was totally fine when it was here. But when it reached there, we were surprised to see the report. And then we realized that some maybe a competitor or I don't know who had done that. And that was a big blow, you know, right in the beginning, especially as an entrepreneur, your first break. So that was a time which was which was tough. And uh, but luckily, you know, I thought that if something is someone is doing that, we obviously on the right track and offering uh, something in the market where we can, we obviously doing getting giving something better, which people don't want. <clears throat> 
the other yeah. was during you know the 2008 2009 that whole uh, finance crash at that time a lot of the people stopped importing products you know they were using local products and that was a time when we actually had a lack of orders we had we have many months where we had very little work to do and we actually had to let people go but uh, you know it was it was just a matter of surviving for a few months and that was also a tough time but we survived that phase and you know luckily uh, things got better and we hired the people we let go back plus what also happened was as a advantage you can say now but at that time it was a disadvantage but now as an advantage a lot of the fly by night operators and you know competitors just left the market and disappeared so it left a smaller pool of competitors to uh, to work with right the landscape uh the landscape became a little bit clearer with only the really good quality companies left exactly but again the beginning part you know initially as any entrepreneur as any startup is i mean especially the different the time between your first order and second order is a is a tough time Mm-hmm. you know sometimes you break in you get one and you know just trying to get a repeat customer that is where you have to also uh, you know just just uh, go with the flow and kind of make sure that you're there yeah i can imagine from a from a hiring perspective it can be very difficult when you start up as far as if if you're building anything with b2c as far as hiring a sales team knowing how to do various things i mean it's a lot easier this day and age to to have uh, be, because of how uh, possible outsourcing is, but you also want high quality employees. Um, exactly. So. You know, sometimes outsourcing is not really the best option. It could be the cheapest option, but the cheapest doesn't necessarily always mean the best. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. No, I appreciate you telling us that because, um, you know, it's, um, because it's important to understand just uh, how how successful food companies grow, and the fact that if you if you start small, you always have your difficulties. It's almost the name of the game, I think. Um, exactly. Exactly. You know, I say uh, in Colombia, there's uh, you know uh, in Colombia, I think exportation and the, the the branding of exporting your products, like export of coffee, everyone loves yeah. it, but they don't realize that exporting costs money. It, it, exactly. it it's not free. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. You know, the, I mean, the, we've we've also met people, and it's uh, you know the whole the the whole business looks very very glamorous, but it's not. It's it's really tough, and especially like you mentioned with food, because you have to go through so many checks and balances at every stage. You know, from the beginning stage. I mean, in Colombia, you have in Vima. In US, you have the US FDA. So you know, you have to go through everything, and some of these places are very rampant with corruption and red tape. You know, you can get a product in and it take you six months and they, they won't even give you an answer for six months and then they'll just say it's rejected. So, you know, you go have to go back to the beginning. So it's uh, the food industry is definitely tough, you know, in the beginning. But if you have a clearer, like you said, a clearer view, then mm-hmm. it's uh, then it gets uh, easier. Yeah, definitely. Great. Now, yeah. one other thing I wanted to touch on Gaurav, I know talking before the show, we went over uh, backwards integration, and it's a, a strategy that you've implemented. And can you just explain to us what backwards integration is and why someone would, would do that? Yeah, sure. So backward integration is basically that, you know, at, at some point uh, in any business, there is the start of the product or service, and there's the end, the end part. And between that, it goes through a lot of different uh, changes you know it's like you take steel you take iron ore and you then you smelt it then you turn it into steel and then you weld it into whatever you want to weld it into and then it becomes a building so what we do with food is that you know we source it then now we package it so our backward integration means that we would like to package it ourselves rather than giving the packaging to somebody else because that way you know we can control costs we can control we get some breaks from the government for setting up industry we help the uh, economy by giving people jobs and uh, we, we control the production, you know, the packaging ourselves, which means we can offer our own quality. Sometimes suppliers, I mean, for whatever reason, you can depend on a supplier for so much, but you always have to have backups. Whereas if you have your own setup, it's it's always cheaper also. So that is just, that is, you know, backward integration. So finally, we want to go from, uh, right from picking the seed ourselves to packaging it and putting it on the shelf ourselves. That would be a completely integrated unit. 
But I think we're a little far away from that for now. So we just want to start with the packaging and then see where we go after that. Fantastic. Well, let's see. Well, Gaurav, now Danny, um, Gaurav and Danny, you know, this has been a great conversation. Um, we wanted to thank you for being on the show. Um, yeah, I feel like, uh, I mean, I feel like we could probably talk, uh, we can probably talk for like hours. So I think we're going to have to have you on another time uh, as well in the next few months to kind of uh, check in and see how things are going and, uh, and how things are progressing, especially with uh, setting up packaging and breaking into the different markets in, uh, in Latin America. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me also on the show, you know, and I hope uh, it helps with, you know, whoever else wants to get into the food business. Yeah, yeah. Def- I-, I definitely think so. Um, Matt, any uh, any parting notes before uh, we sign off on the podcast? Yeah, so again, I mean, we can all agree this was an amazing podcast. Gaurav, we're definitely going to, if you are if you let us, we're definitely going to invite you back. Um, just Thank you. It'll be a pleasure, yes. And just for the listeners, just so you know, we're going to put a link um, to uh, to Guarav's business, um, G Square Soul, um, as well as a, a bio about him, so you can look at his company and you know visit his website and see what he's doing. Um, so everything will be on foodstartupspodcast dot com. Perfect. Thanks. Is uh... excellent. Uh, what, uh, excellent. Last question for you guys, uh, Guarav. You're going to be in Colombia in the next few months. Yes, I should be there by March. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so we're, yeah. we're definitely, uh, Colombia is picking up steam in the food world. Um, definitely feel free to reach out to us and uh, uh, to our listeners uh, so that, uh, you know, we can try to help you out in any way that we can and uh, teach you about Colombia and Latin America and doing business here. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot, Gaurav. Thanks, thanks, thanks for uh, this opportunity. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for 